Hello guys and gal... Seriously? Still nada? Onimusha 2 is set 13 years following the events of the original and has a new protagonist. The famous Japanese sportsman and folklore hero Jubei Yagyu. Jubei. Jubei Yagyu. Jubei. 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 Jubei Yagyu. Jubei. Nobunaga, previously resurrected in Onimusha 1 by demons, is now wreaking havoc around the country. He destroys Jubei's village, killing everyone. Yes, the entire village. Literally, nobody survived this except Jubei because he was away at the time. Feeling an ominous presentiment in his heart, he desperately raced back home. Finding out that everyone is dead honestly made Jubei really upset. Jubei wants to kill Nobunaga and avenge his dead relatives and friends. During his quest for vengeance, he meets other characters who are in one way or another affected by Nobunaga. Following the trend of modeling the protagonist after a famous person, this time the main hero was modeled after the famous Japanese actor Yusaku Matsuda. I knew him as the villain from Ridley Scott's movie Black Rain where Michael Douglas goes to Japan to fight crime and gets revenge for the death of his partner. Jubei and his eyebrows are in this movie. I like him over Samanosuke cause he seems dead fucking serious with those eyebrows. His English voice actor is also really, really serious. You are scouting. Then you shouldn't play pranks. What? A man who shows off too much will be caught someday. He genuinely sounds like a Jap speaking English for real, so I thought it's Matsuda himself. Very uncultured of me because he was pretty much dead by then. Which makes this pretty uncanny. I mean, Capcom using the face of a guy that was dead for at least a decade before the game came out. According to Krapkom, Oni 2 was developed alongside the first game by a different team. Since the game was being developed simultaneously with Tonimusha Warlords, the team that made it had a longer development time and it shows. Keiji Nafuna, our famous goofy producer, said that this team was able to implement a lot of his ideas and improvements that got cut from the first game or needed more polishing. This is rather interesting. Imagine if you commissioned two different artists to draw a portrait of you, but you gave one of them more money and time to finish. Both portraits would have the same face on it, but one clearly has more details and polish to it. They would also differ in style. That's how Oni 2 appears when directly compared to Oni 1. Allow me to translate my own words. What this means is that Onimusha 2 has improved almost to perfection all the gameplay elements introduced in Oni 1. The game plays and feels a lot smoother. There are more enemies on the screen. Animations are faster and better looking. Motion capture is also really, really impressive. There are more side characters with distinct movesets and this time even an extra mode to utilize this to an extent. The list of improvements goes on. It culminates into Onimusha 2, the samurai's destiny, having one of the most addictive gameplay loops you will ever encounter. So the game starts with another epic FMV and it's again breathtaking to look at. Animations, direction, editing and music are outstanding. Everyone knows that Capcom had a studio for these FMVs called Robot and these guys kept getting better with each one they made. It's clear that Nobunaga is the villain this time. He is leading a demon army and they are attacking Yagyu village, killing absolutely everything they run into. It's really brutal and reminiscent of old samurai movies. At one point they show a woman with a baby in her arms falling to the ground, implying that they were brutally murdered too. After the village had been burned down and everyone got uh, 
dead, it transitions to the introductory montage of our main characters, like it's some Saturday morning cartoon. At first I thought this was a weird tonal dissonance that's only present in the opening movie cause it was developed by some other studio, but in truth uh, the entire game is like this. There are many scenes that could trick you into thinking that the game is going for mature and serious subject matter, while on the other hand, uh, horrible voice acting, over the top cutscenes, goofy character design, awkward dialogue and overall atmosphere throughout the game makes it impossible for this story to be taken seriously. One of the characters talk about losing his baby daughter in a fire. Easy. Shh. Easy. You're safe now. This is my baby, my daughter. What? When the castle fell, my daughter was crying like this. I did everything I could to rescue her. Having a drunkard with a goofy looking design trying to convey sadness over losing a child in a Capcom game with their trademark horrible English voice acting while the soundtrack is trying its best with touchy notes is just accidentally hilarious. Or is it really unintentional? One day scholars are going to argue over what the actual tone was supposed to be in all of the Capcom games. Especially this one. Was it supposed to be serious and emotional or is it a comedy gold? I spent a lot of my time watching these cutscenes and please allow me to solve this riddle right away. Listen to me, those who wrote and directed this video game are the low tier gods of entertainment. Anyone else would have killed them. Thanks, Jubei Yagyu. Nani. Anyone else would have killed them. Anyone else would have killed them. While Resident Evil games up to that point in time were funny because of the mistranslations and the voice acting, they weren't as campy as people labeled them to be. It's good to see you're still among the living. It looks like we're not gonna find your brother here after all. To be campy, you need to have the intention behind it, like Resident Evil 4. Well, I really don't give a damn. Rain or shine, you're going down. Or like Oni 2, for example. Silence! Let me go! It's our lord's order! Get away! This game embraces the camp and I swear to god whoever directed the voice actors did his best to make the worst possible takes. It's almost fascinating. There isn't a single scene that doesn't sound or feel off. Again, it's this weird tonal dissonance that... that, that... Let's start with the opening video. Fine, it's developed by a different studio, but they had to know what the story was going for. It's really outstanding how brutal it is. People are being burned alive. You see how ruthless demons are. And Nobunaga, in the midst of it, kills a snake with his own hand. You see playfulness and creativity extinguished by a serpent. After this intro, I was pumped. It really sells you on the setting, the villain, Jubei and his motivation and emotions. Then it jumps right back abruptly into goofy slash retarded territory even before the opening cutscene ends. That would be like me suddenly telling you that I only started this YouTube stuff cause it's the only thing that helps me cope with the death of my grandmother, my only parent and someone I deeply admired. Only to suddenly resume with telling you that holy fuck is this game store entertaining. I thought about showing you funny cutscenes, but that would literally mean I would have to show every single scene involving more than just the main character. Analyzing them bit by bit would make this video 10 hours long, so I expect some outies to do it at some point. This entire game's story, events, characters and dialogue is basically what a 12 year old boy think is awesome. And since I'm also something of a man child myself, it resonates with me personally. In this game, set in medieval Japan, during his journey, Jubei, with his amazing eyebrows, summons thunder out of pure anger. He rides a mechanical horse and uses a giant mechanical swordfish to travel across the sea. 
He has a rival, the greatest swordsman of all demons. Dugentatis, the greatest swordsman of all demons. He flies an airplane to enter another airship shaped like a giant bug. It really is like a cartoon, or even worse, an anime. It exemplifies everything great about Capcom developers and their writers to this day. It's not so bad it's good. It's good because it's sincere, passionate, over the top and silly and I'm 100% certain they were going for this. So, is your daughter pretty? Oh, uh, of course. I think she is the most beautiful girl in the world. Great! Andale gameplay. As soon as you start the game, you are once again given a fourth wall breaking tutorial document explaining the controls. I didn't dwell on the combat mechanics when I talked about Tonimusha Warlords, but combat is pretty much the same in every title in the series. The beauty is in its simplicity. You have an attack button, a magic button, soul uh, sucking button, a lock on button. Oh my god, stop! What are you doing? God damn it, you're right. I'm not gonna drone for 10 minutes on what happens when you press the fucking buttons. It's pretty much the same as in only one, but with more polish to it. A new mechanic is turning into an Onimusha, yay, finally, whatever. Instead, let's talk about the feelings. What does it feel like playing the Onimusha? Two. I said it already, but this time the entire game is built around Isen. That means that you can do it on every single enemy in the game attacking you, including the bosses, and it's envisioned to be played like that. Quick refresher, Isen is this amazing counter mechanic of the game where you insta-kill the enemy attacking you by reacting to his attack at the last possible moment. If you time it right with the following properly timed button mashing, you can chain it and kill pretty much everything in the area. In only one, the mechanic is underdeveloped and many foes have attacks that are really hard to react to. However, in Oni 2 animations are better and hitboxes are better defined. Developers increased the amount of reactable frames to make it easier to, well, react. They balance this by making enemies move faster and come in large numbers. You are constantly under threat because they will stagger you and kill you with ease if you don't know how to defend. It's really impressive from a technical standpoint to see 6 or 7 enemies on the screen on hardware like PS2 and in 60 silky smooth frames per second. So, the conclusion is, it's easier to counter with this and, and your enemies are harder to deal with, thus resulting in the following. Using Isen will get you high like you were doing drugs. <laughs> The alertness, the excitement, my god, you feel powerful, energetic, confident. Wow. It's like getting run with a Baiman hand. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's like peeing after holding it for hours. It's like hugging your kid or seeing him walk for oh, the first on, time. <laughs> it's like your crush laughing at your joke. It's like missing an airplane that got abducted by terrorists. <laughs> it's like making your father proud. It's like all those feelings every single encounter in this stupid fucking game. And it's not just Isen that causes these emotions. It's the sound effect of clashing swords and enemies dying. The visual cues, flashing lights and sparks. It's you seeking perfection, competing with yourself. You truly feel like a samurai practicing sword fighting technique over and over and noticing your own skill improving with each day you spend training. It's addictive to the point of its own detriment. Eventually, you don't even bother to actually fight, so yeah, Michikita is actually right. There is no point in me explaining the controls and moves when your gameplay will boil down to sending everything and everyone. After you actually get good and uh, you understand those timings properly and you start chaining, it's over. 99% of the time you will stand there like an asshole getting hit, waiting for that one Isen to regain your health back. Thankfully, Capcom, like I said, envisioned this happening, so they included the critical mode, where you can only kill demons with Isen. To its addictiveness, it actually helps that every single encounter reads like a small paragraph from a folk tale. Japanese folktale. Four human-like lizards wielding swords were swarming Jubei. 
backing him against the wall. His breathing was under control. There was no need to panic. He knew that he outclassed the demon scum, so he waited for the closest one to swing first and expose his scaleless chest. The lizard attacked, swinging downward from above, trying to cut Jubei in half, but he nimbly deflected the incoming attack with his sword, then quickly dashed forward, cutting the lizard and two of his cousins at once in a heartbeat. He slashed the remaining enemy, sending him flying across the room, then ran to him to stab the reptile through his heart before a fiend could have a chance to get up. He missed because sometimes it's a shitty game, but was able to finally kick him in the stomach and stab him properly, ending this. Jubei finally extended his hand, absorbing their souls calmly, trapping them forever until only silence remained. Or something like that. Thank you, that was wonderful. Okay, clearly I'm not a writer, but the point is, it's cool. The game is only slightly longer than only one, but offers additional difficulty and even gameplay modes and minigames. And it encourages that speedrunning mentality better than ever. Eventually, I got good enough to get that S rank, but then I learned that there are also sub ranks. And after I just saw a video of a guy getting all those sub ranks in one playthrough, I feel cursed, cause that means that I won't stop playing this godforsaken game anytime soon before I get to that level of autism. It's easily the most addictive game you will ever play. You feel an addictive dopamine rush and something, something resembling happiness. I mean it, mastering on Emotion 2 will make you happy. <coughs> when it comes to visuals, the game is using pre-rendered backgrounds again. The one huge advantage that you have with still images as your background in a game like this is that the character and the enemy models really stand out against it. The very first area in the game is especially worth mentioning. The beautiful raining sequence coupled with effects of mud and water. Stuff said that it's inspired by their favorite movie Seven Samurai. It looks absolutely amazing and awe-inspiring. It's a clever intro too, cause nothing you encounter later comes even remotely as visually stunning as this first segment. Although various areas do have interesting effects. Most notably, your second fight with Gogen Dantes is on a beach that has these uncanny water effects. I already talked about improved animations, visual cues and effects. When you complete the game, you can access the making of footage and you can see that all these ridiculous cutscenes actually took a lot of effort to make. To my disappointment, a different composer was responsible for the soundtrack, which means that it's probably not stolen this time around. The composer once again looks like a badass, so there's that. The main theme is great, but overused. The rest of the music is just there. However, the sound effects are among the best on the system. All of the sounds feel distinct and well chosen. I mean distinct within the Onimusha series. They reuse most of the sound effects in all of the games from the series. Especially the whoosh sound when the enemy swings. Somebody thought of making sure that the player could learn when to react just by listening to an enemy and the sound effects. So if you learn it in only one, it might be useful in only two and so on. There you have it, an idea for a YouTube video. Try to pull Zatoichi and play this game blindfolded or something. Addictive as this game is, there are issues that become glaring as soon as you don't have 100% control of the battle. This game, like the first one, uses D-pad tank controls and fixed camera angles. And I already mentioned that the ladder is an issue even in only one, but I didn't dwell on why that much. Imagine this, you are facing a demon, he is preparing to attack you. You think you know what he's gonna do, so you're preparing yourself to successfully defend or block and punish his attack. You're positioning your feet, moving left and right to make sure he's in front of you. Now imagine that as a result of your slight shift to the right or left, the game completely switches the camera angles into a position where you don't see the incoming attack. This happens all the time. Especially aggravating when you are fighting bosses that have long range attacks or attacks that can bridge the distance between you two. On normal difficulty it's annoying but the game is easy overall so you don't really think about it. On hard it will make you pull your hair, if you have it, and swear ruthless vengeance on a guy responsible for this design decision. I understand why they used fixed camera angles, but I honestly don't understand why it has to switch at the angles the way it does. It makes fighting Nobunaga, the pinnacle of the game, 
an absurdly frustrating experience. There are many angles where it's really hard to judge the depth and position of the enemy or even see their animations. This isn't gameplay, this isn't difficulty, this is fighting the game itself. I swear that there are some angles that are used in a specific way just to screw you over on purpose. There are moments where if you run away too far from the camera's point of view, you won't be able to see anything which will result in you being hit and angry. And nobody likes getting hit and being angry. Another glaring issue with the game happens when you down an enemy. In the first game it's preferable to get an enemy down and finish him with a stab. He falls, you approach, wait for a half a second, then you press the attack button. That's it. In Oni 2 this is still the case, except that the game disengages with a locked on enemy the moment he hits the floor, so you can't finish him properly if there's another enemy nearby. Mind you, you can still do this if the other enemy is far away, but it's still inconsistent and, again, annoying. When I talked about the overall tone of this game, I said I found it extremely campy and thus entertaining. It's clear that the game wanted to go in this direction, so I guess okay, but I do have one additional gripe that I have to mention. The survival horror vibe from the first game is almost entirely gone from every aspect except some written documents. While the first game didn't have some terrifying locations, it made up for it with some interesting enemy design and the overall theme of demons and humans being experimented on. Like I said before, there were some genuine attempts at making at least the horror atmosphere. Nothing in Onimusha 2 comes even close to Reinaldo and his design and two main bosses even look like they belong in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The only frightening entity resembling an eldritch abomination in the game is Jubei's mother and that's largely attributed to her voice acting. Who are you? You can do it, my son. I don't want to sound like I'm nitpicking because there is some variety in enemy design compared to Oni 1. They are still cool looking and most importantly they have different attacks so fighting them never gets boring. I just personally think it was a missed opportunity for Capcom to establish another series that would be a must play for fans of the horror genre. After arriving in Imasho, Jubei starts meeting other playable characters. Let's introduce them in the style of one time only narrator from Oni One. This man will eventually conquer the world under the name Hideyoshi Toyotomi. Saiga Magoichi. The guy with a rifle and the first boss from Neo 2. Ankokuji Ekei. The guy with a spear that was in Samurai Warriors 2. Fuma Kotaro. The other ninja you know from Samurai Warriors and now Neo and probably some anime. And finally Oyu. The female warrior that wears skimpy western looking armor showing off her legs and skin. She likes western culture, so she is also fighting with a gladius. I see what you are doing Capcom. You think that you will appeal to my urges with this design and I'm not going to complain about something silly like I did with Kaede. Ok, fair enough. However, unlike Samanosuke and Kaede, all of these characters are based on real people from Japanese history. After all, Jubei himself is a famous folklore legend. That's cool. If you read their Wikipedia page you will see that all of these were larger than life personas with interesting accomplishments or deeds. They all have some connection to Nobunaga and they have their own motivations and goals. Especially Oyu, whose real identity is Oichi, Oda Nobunaga's sister. All of this actually had the potential for some interesting drama and relationships between characters, but it's all done in that awkward goofy manner which is entertaining, yes, but also annoying if you wanted something more from this world. You never see characters talking to each other outside of cutscenes and even if you interact with them they rarely say something plot related. It's redundant to say that all of these are unbearable to listen to in English. When she grew up I would become a feudal lord and make her a princess. So I... <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> However, it made me think that maybe the goofy tone and everything is because of that horrible acting, so I found the undubbed version online and to my surprise, no, I was wrong. 
Even Japanese actors are hemming it up and scenes are still awkward. Finally, the main gimmick of this game outside its combat, the gift giving feature. Basically how it works is you interact with these characters by giving them items that you either find or buy. This unlocks certain items and progresses the story in a different way. Reactions to a present will depend on that person's character. This is such a weird and frankly bad way to explore these characters, but only two teaches you a valuable life lesson. People will like you only if you give them stuff, and the only way to actually make friends is to give gifts. Figuring out or saves coming to find out who likes what and what gifts get you the best reward is rather interesting the first time around. There's enough gifts to keep on experimenting for hours, and it's not as dull as it may seem. You're doing yourself a disservice if you spoil this part for yourself by reading online what you should do. Experimenting with gifts is fine, especially if you get some unique reactions out of them. I love how sometimes they'll accept gifts even if they don't really like them. There are also NPCs in town that have gifts for you to give when you exhaust their dialogue at the right time. This all reminds me of how Resident Evil 3 changes its scenarios if you explore some locations first and discover some events before other ones. Again, this on paper seems great, it's interesting. Secrets and additional details adding to the replay value are more than welcome. So what's the issue? Well, to use RE3 as an example, in Resident Evil 3 you have different events during your playthrough but you never ever feel like you're not getting the whole story. Onimusha 2, on the other hand, not only changes the story, depending on how much you were sugar deading other characters, but it also flat out skips events if you don't bother with this system. It even informs you how many events you missed after you finished the game. This robs you of context if your friendship isn't high enough and in a game that leans on the story this much, it really hurts the overall experience. By getting your friendship high enough at a time of peril for Jubei, all of these characters become playable for a short period so they can save him, just like Kaede was in Onimusha 1. But if you didn't bother raising your friendship with them, the events that put Jubei in peril will never actually occur. Since the ending is still the same, the only real punishment for not indulging your friends is your ranking at the end, which requires you to play as all four of these characters in one playthrough. But even that might not be impacted because you can circumvent this requirement by being fast enough and grinding, which is what I did when I got my first S rank. I think this happened in some misguided attempt to add replay value. Ok, so our game is somewhat short, so what if we make it possible for a player to miss additional gameplay and story segments and we make it even shorter? On the other hand, by playing with this system, giving gifts and wasting your time, you not only get more content, but you also get a game breaking technique that automatically chains all the enemies in the room if you charge your weapon enough. It isn't even that hard or a mystery which items you should trade to get this document. What's annoying is getting through 3 quarters of the game just to learn that your friendship wasn't high enough with AK so you won't get to play as him and get the needed percentage of the story. Overall, it's a stupid gimmick, but it might make you replay the game to see all the outcomes. You need 4 to 6 playthroughs to see every event possible. To get the full context behind every character, his motivation, his ending, you have to engage in this mini game and even then replay the game 4 to 6 times. Again, this isn't a different scenario like in Resident Evil 2, it's not like having to go left in one playthrough and right in the other one. No. This is more like you go left in both playthroughs, but in the other one you have an extra event or cutscene because you gave the right gift at the right time to the right character. I can still imagine someone replaying the game 6 times though, because I've done it. You probably wonder, why would I play this old game 6 times and even then not see all of the events because I didn't use the walkthrough. It really never feels the same. Shocking I know, but this stupid gimmick and the story events are not the reason why this game is so replayable. Also, Capcom obviously took notes, so this feature was never seen again in any of their subsequent games. At least not to this extent. Nobunaga! 
You're too late, Jubei. I've just transferred my power into this golden evil statue. Look at it! Mm. Anyone who witnesses it will kneel before its might. Never! No one will serve a man who has sold his soul to the demons. Mm. You are not worthy. Finally, the last boss is Nobunaga and this fight is the biggest disappointment. They were hyping up this encounter for two games and after finally getting to him all you feel is disappointment. Basically Nobunaga turns into a demon that ends up flying all over the stage and he is spamming magic attacks. It's not only a letdown thematically, the bigger issue is that it's dull mechanically. You spend the game mastering sword fighting and at the end you run around spamming magic, bored. To summarize, Onimusha 2 has improved combat and gameplay over the first game, it has more locations, it has more enemies on screen, it has the same controls but you feel more agile, screen transitions are smoother, Isen is perfected and it elevated this whole game into a must play classic. And after suffering through the hard mode you become a true samurai, not just any samurai but Jubei! Jubei. 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 Jubei has a new Jubei. 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 Playing Onimusha 2, the Samurai's Destiny, is like having the time of your life with a 9 out of 10 girl with beautiful breasts that has eyebrows like Anthony Davis.